Welcome to Conversations That Matter. This episode is brought to you by Audlem Brown, a client-focused investment firm that starts client relationships with straightforward conversations focused on you, your aspirations, and your investment priorities. Audlem Brown has been a supporter of Conversations That Matter from the day we started this show. Their only condition was that we provide a non-biased conversation with people from all sides of all sorts of issues. Of course, we couldn't produce this show without the support of Oh Boy Productions. If you're looking to produce a video or a podcast, I suggest you reach out to them. They can help you produce it. They can help you build your audience. And in addition to that, we need your support. Please pledge a dollar per show at patreon.com forward slash conversations that matter because those dollars add up and play an important role in helping us produce this show. Now to this week's episode. Are we on the cusp of a breakthrough in relations between Indigenous people in Canada and the rest of the country? Or are we swirling around in a quagmire that provides us with the illusion of progress only to see it get consumed at the point of hope? When the current Prime Minister was elected, he indicated he was going to tackle the issues that divide us and embrace our common humanity. Steps would be taken, he assured us, to move us closer to reconciliation. But that begs the question, what is reconciliation? The TRC, or the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, was created to provide a venue for victims of the residential school system to be heard, to have their stories become a part of the public record. But it was not, nor is it, a guidebook to a coming together of equals. We invited Senator Murray Sinclair to join us for a conversation that matters about some of the elements that are required to create a society that goes beyond lip service and becomes one of respect and acknowledgement of our first people's rightful place in our country and in our society. Conversations That Matter is a partner program for the Centre for Dialogue at Simon Fraser University. The production of this program is made possible thanks to the support of the following and viewers like you. Senator Sinclair, welcome. Thank you. <sighs> Having you on the show is really important to me. I uh, started this program uh, after having um, watched the Supreme Court uh, hand down its ruling on the Silcatine uh, case. And I thought, you know, I think that I stay reasonably up on where uh, we're at in relationships between Indigenous peoples and the government of Canada and some of the provincial governments. I wasn't fully up to speed on Silcatine because I, most issues related to First Nations and Indigenous peoples do not get a full airing in regular media. And so it was driving force for me to have to create this show. Okay. Uh, and that was an issue that I, that I started with and went, okay, where do we go from here? And so I would like to ask you the, the same question that I asked per Perry Belgard. Where are we at in our relationships between First Nations and Indigenous peoples and Canadians as a whole in the government of Canada? Well, we're still at the, um, at, at the stage of awareness, I think. Um, and, and what I mean by that is that we're still coming to a sense of what this history is all about. And I think there's still a need to keep repeating that so that people will become not simply more and more aware of what happened, but more and more comfortable with the truth of what happened. Uh -huh. And that they can uh, accept it enough that they can use it as a foundation for moving forward. Part of the problem is that when you hear something new that's totally different f from what you've been taught about the past, you wonder about it. Is that real? Is that true? Is that accurate? And, and then when people say, well, let's do something now about that, there's still this hesitation. Well, maybe we should check out just to make sure that really was what happened. Mm -hmm. And while the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which I was uh, uh, the chair of, did a lot of work and laid a lot of the foundation for that understanding and that awareness. Uh, the reality is that it's a 6,000 page report and yes. people are just not going to pick it up and read it. And certainly if they try, they're not going to be able to do it in one sitting. Even the summary of it is 400 pages long. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, that's a challenge for academics. Um, but so it's a question of us having enough conversation about this history so that people learn to accept it, then we will be comfortable 
with with really talking about how we need to change things. Mm -hmm. But having said that, uh, there is a, a higher degree of confidence that we do have to change the relationship than there has ever been in the past. And that uh, higher degree of confidence not only comes from that awareness that came out of the work of the TRC, but it also has come about because of court decisions, because of uh, public policy decisions that have been made by governments, uh, messaging from our leaders, our national leaders, our provincial leaders, our local leaders, mm -hmm. messaging from the churches, and all of that is uh, causing people to to think that if our leadership, if those who are the leaders within the institutions of our society recognize the validity of us addressing this, then we will too. And, and then on top of that, those who are have always been at the forefront of uh, understanding the history of this and the, the, the problems that came from the past, uh, who've always been speaking about it, now they have an audience that they uh, are able to talk to. Mm -hmm. And so, so I think we're still really churning the corner. We're not, we're not anywhere along that road to reconciliation yet that we can say that we're close to where we want to be. I think we have to recognize that it took us 150 years to create this relationship. When Confederation occurred, the relationship between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people um, in some areas of the country were certainly troubled. I don't think there's any question of that. We had, uh, we certainly had racism in the country, but I think we had racism on both sides. Mm -hmm. I think that leadership on both sides uh, had to come to terms with that. And I think that in the future, we will continue to have racism and leadership on both sides are gonna have to come to terms with that mm -hmm. and they're gonna have to address it. But I think institutionally, the way that our system of government relates to indigenous people and governs the lives of indigenous people is the fundamental change that we need to address, but also the way that we talk to and about each other mm -hmm. is an important change that I think we're just beginning to develop some sense of comfort around. I just gotta get you to hang on for a second while we take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is an independent program that is produced thanks to the support of Audlin Brown. But we also need the support of people like you. And I encourage you to please go to patreon.com forward slash conversations that matter. And please check out our website, conversationsthatmatter.tv, and become a subscriber. There is the harsh reality of life for Indigenous people, especially when they are on banned lands. Mm -hmm. uh, as Perry Bellegarde points out, you take a look at the quality of living in Canada for non-Indigenous people, sixth in the world. Living on banned lands, 63rd. You know, uh, in, in, an inordinate or a disproportionate number of young men in jail and poor health outcomes. And, and so you say, okay, well, how can we start to address those very real problems in communities? Mm -hmm. And without access to opportunity, I think it becomes very difficult to give somebody something to look at and say, but if we do this, this is what we can have. How important is it having uh, the ability to focus on saying, there's an opportunity for you to be able to start to take some control over the course of your life? <laughs> it's a multi-pronged approach you have yes. to take, okay? Yeah. You have to understand that it is about creating opportunity. It's about improving educational levels. It's about closing the economic gap. It's uh, recognizing the importance of um, local entrepreneurship and giving them the same kind of advantages uh, of, uh, of advancing their uh, economic stature and economic uh, foundation that we give to urban economic interests. Um, that th That's part of the dialogue. It's also, I think, important to understand that uh, indigenous youth want the same things that non-indigenous youth want. They want the same kinds of opportunities. Mm -hmm. They want to be able to be successful doctors and successful lawyers and, and become involved in, in the public process. They want to be able to contribute to their communities. Um, but structurally, within our society, there are limits that are placed upon them. So it's hard to 
look forward every day or to have a vision every day about how you're going to do your work as a student and become a successful lawyer when you have to wonder where am I going to eat today or where am I going to get my food today or you know uh, how are we going to be able to live in a house that's got so many people living in it will my house be there will my parents be there when I was I was telling you that I was in North Winnipeg I was talking to young people who went well I might come home from school and my father's been arrested or mm -hmm. the landlord has kicked us out yep. I don't know where I'm going to be and 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 that's just one of the things that I that I think that until you get to see it and hear it firsthand you don't realize that these people are you know shackled when they're within those communities they're not given the educational resources they're not giving the emotional support yes. so how do you say yes I'm going to become a doctor if I have to struggle against all of that as well as still gain the uh, the appropriate uh, knowledge base to be able to grow in that profession absolutely and it's uh that that uh, inability to develop that confidence in day-to-day -day living mm -hmm. that uh, so many within the non-indigenous community have and, and take it for granted yeah. they don't have to worry about who's going to feed them they don't have to worry about their their next meal they don't have to worry about their house not being there tomorrow unless there's an accident of course and it burns but um, they don't have to worry about the same things that indigenous kids have to worry about mm -hmm. and, and then on top of all of that um, there is the fact that within our school system, the way that we educate children about indigenous people has a really negative impact uh -huh, upon yeah. indigenous kids. And it has a negative impact upon non-indigenous kids too because when they talk about Canadian history, for example, there's nothing taught about indigenous heroes, about the people in indigenous Canada during the course of Canada's evolution as a nation, mm -hmm. uh, who contributed to that evolution, who participated in that evolution. Mm -hmm. uh, but you hear all about the very mundane people who did very little, but actually that's magnified now because Canadian history magnifies it. And, and But you do hear some of the incredible horror stories about the wars that occurred between people and mm -hmm. the savagery. Uh, you know, and I remember, and when I was in high school, uh, we were taught uh, about the uh, horrific torture mm -hmm. and killing yep. of Jesuit uh, missionaries yes. uh, in Canada, in Eastern Canada, as though that happened all the time. And we were never taught about what the European colonizing military forces did to indigenous people, very same kind of tortures, the very same kind of violent acts. And not only to to men, but to women and children. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the the teaching of history has been unbalanced. And well, the impact on Indigenous youth is that at a certain point in time, they give up and they say, this is not fair. Right. Uh, my answers are not here. Mm -hmm. And they try to find their answers elsewhere. But it teaches them a negative view of themselves. It teaches non-Indigenous kids a negative view of Indigenous people as well. Yes, and it does. So yeah. they grow up believing in the myth of European superiority <laughs> and the myth of Indigenous inferiority. And, and that has a whole impact upon how leaders talk to each other today. Mm -hmm. So when you see, for example, decisions coming out of the courts in which the court uh, Supreme Court of Canada yep. gives a decision which recognizes the rights of indigenous people to their territory. People are shocked. Uh, politicians particularly will speak out vociferously ab against that saying who are these guys telling us that indigenous people have these rights because we don't think so. We have been taught that when England discovered this land or when France discovered this land that we became the owners of it and that's what we've been taught. Well sure and you can take a look at the Royal Proclamation of 1776 that said that they had to go around and have uh, territory ceded and so on yeah. but you know Buffy St. Perry pointed out to me she says you got to go back before that and understand the, the thinking that was the foundation of this which was the doctrine of discovery which was issued by the the papal church. Yeah. Well there was this mindset that yeah, I'm going to negotiate this with you and you're going to cede it to me because you don't know any better and you don't even, you don't even understand what our motivation is here. Well, see, there wasn't yeah. even, in, in, in the Doctrine of Discovery, there wasn't even a recognition of the validity of right. existence of Indigenous people. 
There, there was uh, horrific massacres that took place after Columbus so-called discovered America. <laughs> yes. There were horrific massacres and, and acts of genocide that occurred against indigenous people in middle America, such that um, there, it, there was a reaction by some of the representatives of the, of the papacy who were accompanying the mm -hmm. Spanish conquistadors. Uh, Bartolomé de las Casas wrote to the Pope and said, this is awful what we are doing to these people. Mm -hmm. And they actually held hearings in Rome to debate the question, are indigenous people human beings? So when you have a, a question uh, when you have that, that, yeah. that uh, debate over that question, yeah. and uh, that tells you what they really were thinking about right. indigenous people. But here's the resolution of it. The resolution was, Yes, they are human, but they're not quite as human as us. And so therefore, you have the right to do as you wish with them. You have the right to ignore their yeah. humanity to yeah. a certain extent. Yeah. That's right, including the fact that they don't have the same property rights that we do. So we have yeah. superior claim to their land because we're superior people. Uh, yes. Yeah. This is our second break. Okay. We'll be back in a moment. Conversations That Matter is an independent program that is produced thanks to the support of Audel and Brown. But we also need the support of people like you. And I encourage you to please go to patreon.com forward slash conversations that matter. And please check out our website, conversationsthatmatter.tv, and become a subscriber. And so it's flawed thinking at the foundation moving forward. So yes, we can point to a good portion of, of Canada, not British Columbia, and say, well, those territories were ceded and we're you know, now trying to work our way through what is happening here in British yeah. Columbia. Yeah. But I think the foundational thinking of it reinforces the point that you made, yeah. is that we're teaching people that indigenous peoples don't have the same value in our society as everyone else. Yeah. And, and I think, from my perspective, This is Canada's great flaw, that until we can, we can reconcile this, as a nation, we can't realize our potential. Because whether you know it or not, I think that it's, you know something's not right here in our home country. When we were appointed to head the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, we brought together the parties to the settlement agreement and asked them one simple question. Tell us what you meant by reconciliation. Ah. When you put that term in the agreement, what did you mean? When you created this commission, mm -hmm. what did you want this commission to do about reconciliation? And I can tell you with confidence that the government representatives, the church representatives, and to a certain extent, some of the lawyers who were representing the survivors mm -hmm. talked about the fact that reconciliation uh, from the from the non-indigenous side was met when all of that money was put into the compensation fund so that that the non government the non-indigenous side of reconciliation had been achieved by getting them to pay into the fund now it was up to indigenous people to reconcile now it was up to them to figure out how to get past this history but here's here's what yeah. that fails to recognize what that failed to recognize was that inherently, structurally, and uh, mentally, Canada and uh, its leadership had created an environment for itself in which it fervently believed in the superiority of its existence to the exclusion of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've written, uh, in fact, it's one of the postings on my Facebook page, the reconciliation will not be achieved when it is seen as a matter of rights by one side and an act of benevolence on the other. It has to be seen as a discussion about rights, about mutual respect of rights. Yes. And it's not there yet. No. So how do we get there? Uh, and I know that this is the, you know, the uh, question, but, but if we don't do it and we, and we continue to deprive future nations of young people, the opportunity to realize their potential, 
in the words of Aristotle, we all lose. Yeah. Everybody loses. There's so much to be gained by having uh, um, uh, respectful interaction between one another that, that we can all benefit from. And, and, and so I'm frustrated. How do we get there? Like, I mean, my own bias is on my sleeve. Yeah. It bothers me. Oddly, and I say oddly because uh, this, this whole process came about because of, of uh, the, uh, the acts by Christian representatives yeah. against indigenous people. <clears throat> but oddly, there's a, uh, there's a story that comes out of the Bible that I think gives us a lesson here that we should pay attention to. Mm -hmm. And it's about Moses leading the uh, Israelites Israel, uh, uh, through, yeah. through the desert for 40 years. Yes. <clears throat> One of the reasons why that story is important, because if you think about it, he did that because the generation that he took into the desert were slaves. Yes. They had lived a life of slavery. And when he came out of the desert, he brought people out of the desert who had never been slaves, ah. who had been able to get beyond that. They may not have yet been able to reconcile in, in the sense of forming that new relationship, but they had stopped thinking of themselves as slaves. And so what that also speaks about is that this is a multi-generational process. Yes. And we have to accept that and we have to attack it on that basis. I've always said education is the key to reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And what that means is that the way that we educate our children about the kind of relationship they should have with each other, indigenous and non-indigenous children, uh, is really going to build the foundation for our relationship of mutual respect in the future. Mm -hmm. uh, because remember, as I said, it took us 150 years to create this problem. It may not take us 150 years to fix it, but mm -hmm. it's going to take us more than five. It's yes. going to take us more than 10. Probably will take beyond my lifetime and maybe even beyond the lifetime of my children. But each generation, each and every one of us has to persist at moving this conversation along and push at the parameters mm -hmm. and the perimeters of the limitations that we face. Yes. If, we do not, if we do not keep pushing, mm -hmm. then things will just stabilize where they are now and that's not good. Third and final break. We'll be right back. Conversations That Matter is an independent program that is produced thanks to the support of Audlin Brown. But we also need the support of people like you. And I encourage you to please go to patreon.com forward slash conversations that matter. And please check out our website, conversationsthatmatter.tv, and become a subscriber. When you uh, issued the final report for the TRC, you quoted... Professor Baldwin, I believe it was, from the United States, who said, you may think that the, you're done with the past, but the past may not be done with you. And uh, that's that was, where, that was, was that? Chief Crochu. Uh, oh, Chief was Reg, it? Ch Chief Reg Crochu. Okay, I, I'm, <coughs> I'm giving attribution to the wrong person. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, Chief Reg Crochu, one of our uh, elder advisors, um, said that to us at uh, a number of our events. But when he first said it, um, it, uh, it was really quite a striking moment, and, and that's exactly what he said. He said that uh, you may think that you are through with the past, but is the past ever really through with you? That's what you have to understand. Reconciliation is going to be hard for that reason. It's yes. because <clears throat> what that talks to me about, it's because the structures that we have built around our thinking in the past will continue to exist. Even if we say to each other, I really like you, I want yeah. to be your friend, and let's be friends, and we agree that we're going to be friends. But in the meantime, when our kids go to school, our kids are going to continue to be taught with the old curriculum right. that created bad relationships in the beginning. So we, have, we need to change the curriculum. Yes. We need to change the structures of the child welfare system, which say that... In order to keep your children, you have to have so many square feet in your house, you have to have so many bathrooms per person, mm -hmm. or you have to have so many um, rooms uh, for certain numbers of people. You, you have to have trained uh, foster figures in the house if it's not the natural parents. Uh, all the natural parents have to take uh, 
training programs in order to how to be proper parents. So all of By that, somebody else's mm, definition yeah, of all what of those, proper is. That's right. All yeah. of those biases that are built in to the system need to be challenged and need to be changed. And if we don't attack that part, that result of history, and if all we attack is our willingness to, to change the way that we deal with each other, we're going to fall back into the same ways within a generation. Well, collectively, I think we have to work together on all sides of this issue to make sure that as many people uh, as possible understand that, that everybody has a responsibility to try and move us to a place that is respectful of everyone. And everybody can, and, and I, I'll tell you that one of the most common questions I get when I do presentations and have conversations with people is, what can I do? Yeah. And my first advice to them always is, read the calls to action. Understand them. There's always an explanation in the report mm -hmm. that explains why that call to action is important. Find something in those calls to action that you can do. Yes. And then try to do it to work on it, even if all you will do is you help other people understand the importance of those calls to action. That's important too. Mm -hmm. We have um, situations where, where grandmothers are getting together and having tea uh, in order to talk about the calls to action, just so they can understand it, and then one of them will be designated, well, call up somebody and mm -hmm. say to them, call up the mayor and ask them, why aren't you doing something about this? Yes. And that's important. One thing begets the next. Yes, that's important. Thank you very much for sh taking this time to share with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And just before I go, I want to encourage you to subscribe to Conversations That Matter at conversationsthatmatter.tv. And please support us also on Patreon. One last thing, of course, check out oboy.ca for all your podcast and video production needs. In fact, if you want to suggest a topic, produce a video or a podcast, get in touch with the team at Oboy oh Productions. They'll work with you to produce a show just like this one that you can find at oboy.ca oh or conversationsthatmatter.tv. And finally, but most certainly not least, I want to give a shout out to Derek Hader, Arnold Chang, and Greta Gibson. See you next time.